All right. So, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk at the TSM, uh, TMS talk season three, episode five. So uh, my name is Kawan, and I will be today's <coughs> moderator. Uh, I am currently a research scientist at MIT. And um, uh, 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 you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so for today's talk, we're going to um, divide up into um, three sections. So I, I will briefly give an opening and an introduction of our society. And then I'll hand over to today's host and speaker, uh, Professor Zhao and Professor Wen. Um, and the talks will be, be about 45 to 50 minutes and that followed by a 30 minute QA. Um, so um, let me first give a brief introduction of our society. So the Marley Society or TMS for short is a nonprofit organization that aims to build a community for young scholars to freely and equally build connections, share their work and exchange thoughts. So we currently have three kinds of events, TMS talks for academia, uh, WBA talks for uh, non-academia and TMS workshops for uh, skill set building. So if you want to know more about the society and the events, you can do so by visiting our website, um, sub subscribing to our WeChat or uh, Twitter channels, or by scanning the QR code, code here. Uh, we are also open to uh, speaker applications. So if you want to uh, be the next speaker, please email us today. Um, now, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Professor Hui Chan Zhao to um, introduce our speaker. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hui Chen Zhao from Tsinghua University. And uh, today I feel very honored to be the host for Professor Wen Li. Uh, not only because that uh, Professor Wen Li is one of the best uh, scholars in China in the area of robotics, especially the young scholars. Um, also because I have known Professor Wen Li for like six years. And uh, we think we met for the first time in Agra 2015. Uh, back then, I was uh, a second year or third year PhD student, and uh, Professor Wen Li was still a young professor. But now, it's, it's really great to say that Professor Wen Li has now become a big professor, I, I think. So um, let me introduce Professor Wen Li. So Professor Wen Li is currently the head of the Mechatronics and Automation Institute at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Beihang University. His current research in, uh, interest includes like bio-inspired robotics, soft robotics, and also robotic intelligence. I think later we will hear some talks, uh, some of uh, some uh, contents in his talk about what does uh, he mean by the robotic intelligence. It would be a little bit different for the more popular artificial intelligence. He has published more than 90 journal or conference papers, including at least the one science robotics paper, a science advances paper. Also some very top tier journals like RDRR and IEEE uh, TRO in the robotic theory. Um, his representative work was featured by Nature Science and also MIT Technology Review and many other uh, outlets. Um, he was also uh, he has also received the Chinese National Science Fund for Excellent Young Scholars in 2018, and also the Stephen Vogel Young Investigator Award and also the Xiong Yulun Young Investigator Award in 2020. Uh, uh, I think also Professor Wen Li is very active and uh, did a lot of service work in our area, including he currently is serving as associate editor for soft robotics, RAL, and also uh, bioinspiration and biomimetics. I think Professor Wen Li has, uh, uh, has done research in a quite range of areas. So I really look forward to this talk, even though I have, uh, uh, I have uh, been at uh, Professor Wen Li's talk for many times. So uh, let us welcome Professor Wen Li to give us uh, this talk, Bio-inspired flexible surfaces, adhesives, and tentacles for soft robot. Welcome. Okay, uh, so I'm going to uh, share my slides first. Uh, can I see my slides, everyone? Uh, okay, so okay. So first, I would like to thank Dr. Zhao, uh, Professor Zhao, very much for his uh, wonderful introduction uh, 
of uh, my biography. So you don't have to spend that time. So, um, um, so today um, I'm very happy to give a talk in this is uh, so, uh, in this Mark Lead Society because I just heard that this is a very great platform for young scientists. So I would like to share some of my experience of my past projects. Um, I put in my title as Marine Bioinspired Flexible Surfaces, uh, Adhesives, and Tentacles for Soft Robots. So I put three images here on the cover to show uh, some of the representative snapshots for these projects. Um, I'm Li Wen uh, from Beihang University. So I would like to start from this uh, diagram. Uh, so this, uh, this is uh, actually a diagram uh, which has been defined by uh, Professor Prekler and Professor uh, Fumi Aida in 2007 in a science paper. So which actually contains three uh, main contents. One is controller. Here's uh, and then which uh, have exchange, information exchange between a robot's body and its kinematics and dynamics. And then the robot interact with a task, uh, you know, having a task and interacting with the environments. So that's old theory of robotics where, uh, so the, the, the kinematics and dynamics of the robots has been uh, predefined. But until recently, and more and more material scientists and also biologists and also mechanics join the team of the robotic research. So that's why more morphological shape and material properties and also including the sensory neural structures has been implanted into the body dynamics of the robots. And then people make um, bio-inspired robots or soft robotics for two reasons. I think the most important reason is for application like grasping, you know, uh, also um, swimming or manipulations uh, to overcome the traditional disadvantages of the rigid robotics. Another uh, important reason to making this, all these types of robots is to test biological hypothesis uh, to answer some of the very fundamental scientific questions. So uh, I want to give, also show this, uh, uh, this figure here, uh, um, and also followed by a definition by Professor Metin City. He published a paper uh, very recently on extreme mechanics letters and define uh, the uh, physical intelligence. And he thinks that physical intelligence, I think uh, as a new paradigm, uh, uh, which can be very helpful for robotic fields. So soft robots is one uh, representative example. So if you imagine uh, like any uh, biological, uh, like animals, uh, biological uh, creatures, or even robots as a physical agent, it contains, a its intelligence can be divided into computational intelligence and also the morphological intelligence. Um, so these, these are two different aspects. And if the intelligence of the physical intelligence uh, he think that it's not only enabled by their brains, their uh, computational intelligence, which has been studied very extensively by machine learning and computer scientists, but also their physical intelligence encoding in the body to operating in unconstructed, uncertain, and changing complex environments. So that's um, why the soft robots recently become very popular because just simply using soft material and some structures, you can grasp in a wide variety of objects, which is very difficult for the traditional robots to do. So just like a soft gripper, this one. So uh, people are working on soft robot grippers for uh, many, uh, for uh, many, many papers working on this. So I wanna take another very extreme example down here to show this is a fish swimming in the water in the vortex, but it's not a live fish, it's a dead fish. But how can a dead fish can swim in the water? 
So that's because its body shape, its flexible uh, flexibility and, and the stiffness enable uh, its movement of its body can shape just like when it's swimming in Hawaii. So um, driven by this uh, curiosity, so I would like to talk about three projects in my lab where, uh, uh, to show the morphological or physical intelligence of them, of them uh, from the biological world, which can inspire future robots. So the first project that I want to talk about is a shark skin. So if you look at this image, this is a, a scanning electron microscopy uh, image of the shark skin on the shark is. Uh, we hope to, uh, you, uh, to understand what the shape means. So how does that one can reduce the water draft? For the second image you sh as shown here, it's a, it's a remora, which has a very strange disc on its dorsal side. Uh, and how can this re uh, the, the remora can hitchhiking on marine animals? And the third one is an octopus, which have eight arms, and each one of the arms are very long and also slender and can wrap around and quickly catch the prey in the oceans. So according to, I hope that uh, people would understand the physical or morphological intelligence according to these uh, three examples after my talk. And of course, we can have more discussion. So to start, I want to start with our first project uh, on the shark. So this is one shark, um, which has a beautiful streamlined body shape right here. So if we using a microscope to look at its surface, it's not smooth. Instead, it has a, a three-dimensional complex structure like this. For example, this is a denical, which has a, uh, on the middle body of the shark, its denical looks like a tooth-like structure, three with three ridges, with the middle ridges longer than two side ridges. If we move the microscope on its nose, we can see that its denical shape changes to like a water droplets or like a stone, which is relatively smoother than the middle part of the, part of the body. So which means that um, the shark denical on this body, the shape varies from different positions. So, and also if we take one piece of skin and cut it out, and we found that it's, uh, uh, so there are rigid skins embedded, uh, rigid denticles with a tooth-like material embedded into flexible skin material. So, okay, all right. So this is a top view of the, uh, of the denticles. And if we're using a very simple equations um, to describe the shark skin, it's, um, it's a rigid three-dimensional identicals plus flexible schemes. So it's a rigid materials and soft materials. So the questions um, um, at that time, I hope I have two questions. The number one is we hope you fabricate a synthetic three-dimensional rigid identicals into a flexible membrane to highly mimicking the shark skin structure so that we can understand the second question is the hydrodynamic function of the biomimetic shark skin. So we want to build a prototypes and then use a prototype to understand the fundamental question of the shark skin. So we took a small piece of shark skin, which is about two millimeters square on the middle body portion of the shark. And then we did a micro CT scan um, of, the, uh, of the, the skin piece. We can see that thousands of the identicals um, are embedded into the soft tissues. And we don't need to analyze all of them. We just to pick one small identicals out and do the three-dimensional reconstruction. So we can see that each one of the identicals, we use a total, totally 13 parameters to qualify this single tentacles, but we can see some of the parameters. It's left, for example, its length is about 140 microns, while its width is about 125, and also we have to have a height of 110, and also it's not flat. It have an erection angle of around 13 degrees. We use those parameters to 
uh, define or quantifying the single identical so that we can fabricate them. So at that time, it's uh, the year of 2012, if I remember correctly. It's uh, multi-material 3D printing is still in the uh, infancy. It's very preliminary. So we really spend a lot of time to think about how to fabricate the shark skin. But before fabricating fabrication, we need to design the shark skin. Just now you show the image, it's a single identical, but how to reconstruct in a, a shark skin, like a, with a lot of skin identicals on it, just like the shark, a uh, real shark biological counterparts do. So we using, uh, uh, we design to array the identicals on a piece of the membrane as, uh, as shown here, where the pink is identical, rigid identical while the gray is a memory substrates. So here shows the lateral views uh, where you can see that there is a spacing between each identicals and also there's an anchor uh, which allows the identical to firmly embed into the memory materials as shown here. So, and then after designing this, uh, the shark skin, we will next step is think about the fabrication method. So we thought about the micro nano fabrication method total lithography in the kitchen, but also of these part of the traditional fabrication are two to only have two dimensional features. So while the scale of the shark skin only have 150 microns or angular long, how to fabricate them? So there's no fabrication uh, technology at that time to fabricate this. So we have to scale it up. Um, so, we, and eventually we choose uh, the three or four in three dimensional uh, multi-material 3D printer to fabricate. So, and um, we, after a long time testing, uh, we, so here's the SEM images we got. Um, each one identical has been scaled, scaled up like seven to 10 times um, and have a length of about, about one millimeter. But this is a rigid identical embedded into a flexible membrane. Um, I think it's uh, in 2014, the multi-material 3D printing has been very, uh, uh, has used a very, uh, very few times. So um, I think uh, this, this image shows um, the basic feature, especially the flexible feature of the shark skin. Um, and uh, we get some media coverage. So we wanna know it's a hydrodynamic function which means that if the shark skin can reduce the drag, or what other hydrodynamic function the shark skin do. So we make two uh, foils. One is basically with the shark skin, why one is without shark skin is smooth. So just like the, uh, uh, so the image down here shows, so the flow comes this way, we put in the water tank and testing its static drag. And we found that under certain uh, speed range, they can reduce the drag up to like 8.7%, while the speed increase would gradually uh, increase in the drag. So, which means that shark skin can reduce the drag, but under some conditions. So, um, and also we uh, figure out that it's a drag reduction range within this uh, uh, flow speed. We also use some non-dimensional or dimensionless parameter to describe this phenomenon. And also we flap the shark skin in the water tank. And we found that the shark skin can generate in 4.7 um, speed increase. Um, so the way we measure it is by uh, finding the critical uh, self-propellant speed where the stress and drag force balance so and find that speed and uh, compare the shark skin with a smooth control. And we can see the benefits happens here uh, with a pitch angle, which is about 10 degrees. So this motion is very similar to the shark tail. Um, so which shows the uh, possible reasons of why the shark using this kind of kinematics, which could be maximized its uh, thrust performance. Finally, we did some uh, uh, PFE analysis of the foil and put by putting, by shedding lasers and putting particles in the water and we analyze the vortex on the leading edge of the foil. And we found that the vortex strength has been uh, enhanced 27% compared to the, uh, 
compared with the smooth control. So, um, and these results uh, remind us uh, shark skin may not only reduce the drag, but also may increase the thrust by enhancing its leading edge vortex. So now I, there are more and more measurement uh, you know, approach to understand the more details of the shark skin. For example, this work has been carried out in um, 2018 after I leave uh, Harvard University. So this is uh, Dylan Wright, who is using a gel site, which is a soft material uh, measurement. Uh, to measure the shark skin surface. We can see that he, uh, he can immediately get the surface uh, geometries and also get the data of the shark skin, which is not um, possible uh, in 2000, before 2015. So this is because of the uh, soft sensor technologies uh, advancement. So we can see that uh, the shark skin have the uh, ridge heights of around 15 microns. Um, if you have the dashed line over here, um, so the x-axis is a distance, the right axis is height. So here's a, here's a data of the real shark skin, which means that this is a shark skin is still very small. Um, so if we want to uh, understand more about the shark skin, so here's uh, some recent work. Uh, which has not yet been published, is we did some trials using the most advanced uh, 3D printing technologies. We can print off scale shark skin. So uh, you can see that uh, the shark identical has been arrayed by predefined partners. And so here is a scale bar, which is about 500 microns. And if we keep zooming in, this is 200 microns, which means that shark skin is shark skin identical. Uh, each one of the shark skin identical is about 100 micron, which is the same size as the real uh, shark identicals. So here's the one uh, single identical. Um, uh, we hope that the art scale shark skin would further enhance our understanding of the animals. Because by using this prototype, unlike the previous prototype, the scales water, we have to use some fluid similarities and, um, uh, to do the analysis. To do the math work, but now we have the upscale shark skin, which might could and help us to, to understand more about the biological counterparts. So this is the same size. Um, it's not possible to fabricate even smaller ones. We also tried that. So this is one uh, we use the nanoscribe to printing each one of the identical, which is about ten times or even smaller identical. So we can see that here is a kind of uh, optical images, and here's a, uh, the SEM images from the top and side and the bike views of the identicals. So we hope that 3D printing technologies would further help us or advance our understanding of the animals. Um, um, and here's the, 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 for the first the shark scene work, here's my views on the future as uh, we can print the shark scene upscale or a different size and also uh, adding functional biomimetic mucus on it so that it can be worked on the, a lot of uh, uh, possible application, including airplanes or the tubes or the wind turbines or even the submarines. Because I think the mucus would help the shark skin to do some self-cleaning and also uh, to further reduce the draft. So, but I think this needs a collaboration of, of the mechanical fabrication and also the materials like the even chemistry. Um, so, and, and then I will, I'm going to jump to the second project. When I'm doing the shark scene project, um, I found I try to find a very nice image of a shark, but there's always a, a parasite sticking on the shark, which is a, I don't know what it is. And then I asked my colleague, I remember when I'm doing my postdoc, I asked my, one of my colleagues, he's uh, working on deep sea biology. So he told me that this is, oh, this is Remora. So this is, which is very commonly seen, not only, only on the shark, but also on a wide range of marine animals. For example, he can stick on the big boxfish, 
which uh, shark is just for smooth. So this is a shark, uh, which is a lemma shark. And also this is a whale shark. And also this is a human diver. And also it's oxygen pumps. So he, so this thing can basically uh, stick on anything on water. And also he hitchhiking on these animals. Once hitchhiking successfully, you don't have to spend extra energy. And also he can do a lot of things on these hosts. For example, he can eat. So, and also he, they can mate. So, and a lot of things. So this, so this is a close view of the, uh, of the remora, where we can see that it's a, on its bike or its dorsal, they have a evolutionary modified dorsal fin. So it's a, actually a dorsal fin like this. And then after millions of years become flat and then become a disc like this. So this disc can help the remora to resist a large shear force and also can generate a lot of a, a, a large pull force. So, so that it can stay on the animals. Compared with the previous uh, adhesion methods, for example, the widely studied or well-known gecko dry adhesion, which is basing, uh, basically based on venerable force. And also the tree for frog, which is a, a, a leaf in the air, but also the surface effect. So its mechanism is based on capillary. While the underwater animals, like the remoras, it's a less understood at that time. So to understand this, first we need to understand the animals. What we do is start from a, a, a remora specimen, we we'll cut the head of a remora specimen, we're putting the micro CT machine and reconstructing its, uh, its organs. We can see that here, the red means the soft muscles, uh, maybe I should stop the video. Uh, and while the white means the bony structures. While we see the bony structure, we can, from this raw video, we can see that there is some hierarchical structure on the surface. What are they? So, and then we did a uh, you know, 3D reconstructing of its disc and then I analyze its bony structure first. We can see that there are some rows of bony structure we call this namelae. So each one namelae, they have substructure or hierarchy structure on the surface. Yeah, so it's, what are they? So they are, we, call, uh, we can see that the three rows of spikes or spinules. And each one spinule have about 200 microns of diameter on its base and also a height of uh, around 300 to 400 microns. And what's more interesting is this structure is not static. It can move up and down. More specifically, it's driven by the erector muscles and the depressor muscles. And then it's a mammalian ventral process can um, erect or fold, or what we'll call this rotations. So it's an active structure, it's not passive. So based on this uh, biological understanding, and then we start our fabrications. So to mimic these, uh, the, the, the biological remodeler, uh, biological mammalian mechanisms, uh, we build a biomimetic mammalian uh, mechanism, which uh, we start from the simple ways using a pressurized or uh, use a soft uh, fiber reinforced muscles to, which can be pressurized or depressurized to generate uh, linear translations. And then this linear translation can cause a rotation of it by mimetic ventral process. And then finally, actuating the mammalia to having a pitch angle. So to fabricating this mechanism of the disc, we, uh, we define the material in the uh, SOLIDWORKS model. So where different color means different material stiffness. So from rigid to soft, it, it's a material stiffness spans four orders of magnitudes. And we print this uh, disk through one time according to our uh, 3D printer, multi-material 3D printer. But there's one material uh, they can, uh, the 3D printer cannot do. 
fancy expanders. So we use a laser to cut a couple of fiber plates. Um, so this work is helped by Kevin Chen. Uh, he's now a professor at MIT. So he's using his laser skills to cut a couple of fibers so that the, um, so we can see that the sharp structure is very similar, biological relevant to the biological counterparts. And, and then we have many rows of these structures and insert them into the disk, 3D printed prototypes. And we flip the bike and adding the soft muscles on this bike. And then this prototype, the lethal prototype is done. So we can see, according to the microscope, we can see the rows of the spinnings uh, shown like this. And also the disk can uh, undulating or do uh, the motions erecting and folding its uh, mammalia, like just like the biological counterparts. So here's the side views. And also we compare, so on the left view, it's a biological remora. On the right, it's a robotic. So we can see that its motion is very similar. And then we tested its force. Uh, we tested the pull force in the vertical direction. We found that it can generate in 340 times of its own weight. And we're also testing its shear force. We found that when it's an amalgam erect up, the force can uh, increase uh, significantly from uh, up to like almost like two times. So which means that rotating the mammalia is very useful for generating a much larger shear force. To demonstrating the possible applications, uh, in our previous work, we have implemented this prototype with the very simple underwater uh, ROV, um, and a console can swing and approach to a surface just at a remora, and also can detach and re return back to the swing space. But it can stick to the complaint surface and also to like a shark skin. Um, so we hope this, uh, this, uh, this robot can help us to understand more about remora and also uh, may possibly uh, use for some future application. So this work has been published. Uh, and then people ask, okay, it's a, does this robot have a lot of uh, hazard tables and uh, it's not uh, it's not fully autonomous, and also people question about if you use air, what about underwater applications? So recently we have made a untethered and also uh, uh, aerial aquatic hitchhiking robot based on this uh, remora disk. As uh, this manuscript manuscript is still under review, I'm going to, I would like to show show some of the videos. So as shown here. This robot can take off from the water and with a camera uh, mounting on uh, its board. Okay. And also it can uh, stick to a uh, fast flow stream and stay there and will remain very stable by using its disk. So on the right, we can see that this robot can fly out of the, uh, the ocean and also we can swing uh, attached to a swimming host. As shown here, we can see that this robot is, is hitchhiking on a marine robot. And according to its onboard cameras, that it can see what's going on on the seabed. If we go deeper, maybe it's a, uh, it's less dark, but we can see that there's uh, some like sea urchin and uh, underwater seafood animals can be observed. Also, it can grasp in like a sampling place out of water because we embed the, the disk underneath. And also it can hitchhike in on, the, uh, on other, uh, uh, other uh, uh, underwater uh, vehicles. So with this, I, I would like to, uh, to simply sum up like the second project, uh, which is about the Remora disk, is we understand its morphological features, and then we think about how we can fabricate them. And finally, we, uh, we 
uh, demonstrating this robotic applications and also uh, make a robots from tether to untether. And we hope that in the future, uh, the remote robot can be more intelligent and autonomous. And finally, I would like to talk about the uh, octopus, which is more like uh, uh, intelligent animals compared with remora uh, and the shark, because the octopus can employ their arms and the suckers to catch prey of almost anything, including animals of all shapes and sizes. How did this happen? Because the uh, octopus have very powerful and strong arms. The arms can not only bend, but also they have suckers on them. Not only just one, but many suckers. So we can generate very strong suctions, and also their suckers have just like our finger; it's very sensitive. So to understand the, the octopus arms, we need to first study its morphology. So um, first, we uh, we hope to find some very good images from the internet about the octopus, but we found the, that there are many different octopus fishes. Just like this too, is if you look at the uh, some octopus mimicus and compare that with the Aladdin, so which has a very, the some octopus mimicus has a very long and slender arm, while the Aladdin have a short but browny arms. So it's a, if we describe these uh, tentacles, so one is to have a small taper angle while another one has a larger taper. But they have a unique feature is this. Both of the, uh, the species, or all the octopus species, they have uh, the suckers on their arms. So we analyze the data of, of almost the 10 species of the octopus and it calculated its taper angle. We found that its uh, arm taper angle is between three degrees and 13 degrees. So we hope to study the, how the tapering and the bending and suction, these two features would affect the, uh, affect the octopus grasping. So we built a very simple uh, octopus, octopus robot model, so which has a arm taper angle alpha shown here, and also has the suckers along the tentacles. <coughs> so yeah, the tentacle can bend and also can, uh, can have the suction. And by using simulations, we found that the tentacle taper angle is inversely related to the curvature, while it's directly related to the force, which means that if you have a larger taper angle, it can bend less, but we, uh, it can generate a larger force. So we fabricating two uh, prototypes at the same time with two different taper angles. One is 4.5. One is a larger taper angle of nine degrees. We can uh, observe that the smaller taper angle prototype can grasp in small size, lightweight stuff, while the larger taper angle, they can grasp in heavy and more uh, you know, larger sized objects like a practice bowl. But we can see here, the smaller taper angle, they can grasp in like a live crab, which has a very strange shape because of its, its flexibility. So what is the difference well, of the, why the tapering angle is important? We, here we did a comparison between a taper and a non-tapered shaped prototype. We stick them on the glass plates and then peel it off. So we, and then we measure the force. So the force profiles show that when uh, the, Taper angle prototype can generate a larger PO force and also can stick longer on the surface. If you look at the red curve here, that's uh, at a human time, that's much longer than the, uh, and the blue curve, which is uh, representing uh, the traditional form, which have a, a, a identical uh, cross sectional shape. So, which means that the tapering shape um, offers more flexibility. That's generating larger adhesion time and the force of for the suckers. And by using the bending of the suction features, we can use a prototype to stick and then so wrap around a piece of paper and uh, handle that to a human hands. 
and also it can retrieve objects from very narrow opening. This is because it has these two important features. One is tapering and one, another is bending and suction. So I would like to show this uh, video once more is it can, how it can grasp in a practice ball with 75 centimeter diameter. Because the first they have locating all the sockers on top and then bend the arm to uh, let all the sockers stick in on the surface. So as shown here, I would like to claim that the morphological features here, specifically the tapering and the bending and suction can improve the grasping of the tentacle. So here, I, I would like to show this, uh, show this video. Uh, so this video is uh, one collaborated projects between um, between our labs and the professional, which integrating the octopus tentacle with uh, the formerly continuous R. So this is more like a future of how these continuous octopus R can work in uh, beside the human beings or become our co-workers. Okay, so and also at that time, uh, uh, some uh, uh, politician, political person has uh, made this uh, it's prototype. So and under after understanding the morphological features of the of the, uh, the tentacle prototypes, we found that it's uh, it still have some uh, disadvantages uh, because it can not, for example, cannot stick on or adhere to the like, rough surface. Uh, like the 3D printed prototypes. So we decided to add a little bit more material or smart materials to it. Uh, here we call this material intelligence, uh, which is also a very hot topic in the research field right now. So we use organo hydrogels to, uh, as a soccer materials, uh, which uh, uh, in, inside inner network uh, can be tuned by electrical currents. If you add electrical currents, it would change, uh, convert to the thermal, and then thermal would change the internal networks. And then its material stiffness can be tuned because of the uh, electrical currents added to it. Uh, it's, uh, it uh, its ions modulus can change from like uh, one megapascal to like a, a, a reduced down to uh, one order of the magnitudes. Because of this, it can adapt to surface with different heights. For example, under 17 volts, it can adapt to rough surface with around two millimeter um, height. And also it can, uh, when you stick to a, a smooth surface, it can generate more surface area of contact. As shown here in this, uh, in this video, now it can grasp in a, a 3D printed prototype with a rough surface by simply adding a 10 volts water gen. If you're adding a, and also it can grasp in a basketball with bumpy surface by simply adding eight volts on it because it can uh, generate, uh, um, uh, it can reduce the uh, Young's modulus of the soccer materials. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to uh, simply uh, introduce some other uh, by Inspire software was in the lab. For example, by understanding the uh, octopus of uh, the arms, uh, we can use this continual soft arms for underwater delicate grasping. For example, this shows how the soft arm can work on water under like uh, depths of 10 to 20 meters to grab spin, to grab like sea urchins and some other seafood animals uh, using a fully autonomous robot manner. And also we build some other prototypes like, uh, like robotic fish with morphine fins to understand how the fish fin can, um, can affect the swim performance. And here we show that uh, by integrating the soft manipulator with an uh, underwater walking device, it can, um, 
can walk in on water in a very quietly without disturbing water and grasping um, and any objects on water by using like a, a underwater um, a lead or locomotion ways. Um, with this, uh, I would like to thank my lab members uh, and also uh, the project of collaborators uh, uh, previously uh, here, the three projects uh, uh, collaborated with uh, Professor John Potter and also Ravi and also Kate Bertotti. Um, and with this, I'd like to thank uh, the audience and thanks very much for the organizations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wen, for a great talk. Um, I think yep. I've heard many interesting underwater animals. So uh, could I start with my first question before um, other like listeners ask their question? So why are you interested in um, animals and water? What is the driven force for you to go into deep sea and also underwater? Because you, you are in Beihan University, which is a, a great university that are uh, really uh, expert, uh, has a lot of expertise in aircraft and uh, aerospace. Why do you interested in animals and water? Okay, so Huichang, thanks very much for the, for the question. Uh, first, I would say this is curiosity. First, mm -hmm. I, I love underwater stuff. I, personally, I, love, I like the scuba diving and also <laughs> I love underwater animals. Uh, so I love that, like the BBC on Earth, Blue Planet. I've watched those, uh, the, those videos many times. So mm -hmm. since I'm young. Um, so I think the curiosity is one. The second one is I think on water because of the, the gravity has been balanced by, and the, by the buoyancy and, and the water floating force. So I think softer robots and it's all softer material robots, they don't have to suffer from the gravity effects, mm -hmm. which is very, uh, I think they, which is very challenging for the, for the soft robots application in the air. For example, if you compare the motion of a soft emitted layer in the air with the rigid robots, it actually cannot exceed the performance of the rigid robots. But if you put on water, I think this uh, situation reverse because we did some comparison. I think that on water, like the soft emitted layer is just like the animals, like the octopus. They are maneuverable, they are agile, and also they are much easier to control than the situation in the air. So I think that's one example why we think that soft robots or vine-inspired robots underwater could be uh, promising for, <clears throat> for applications and also show that about soft robots. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for the question. Um, next, I think there is the one who is uh, raising his hand. Sure, you right? Uh, yeah, but can I go uh, ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pro Professor yeah. Wen, thank you so much uh, for this very inspiring uh, talk. I learned a lot. So, uh, I'm a you sure. you. Yeah. I'm an assistant professor at Purdue University, and mm -hmm. previously I actually worked on GeoSci uh, uh, at MIT uh, Ted oh. Addison's lab. So I saw your first uh, first talk show the GeoSci. I'm very familiar <laughs> with that. Yeah. So yeah, uh, thank you for this talk. Uh, I have a question about actually two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is like this? Uh, you mentioned uh, like a uh, frog, uh, 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 gecko, and uh, this uh, uh, room, uh, the 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 fish. They have different uh, like a. Uh, um, how do, how do you say, dry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, at the end of the second talk, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the robot or the drone can, uh, for example, grab some objects on the, uh, on the bottom of the water <clears throat> and lift it up. So in this case, the situation kind of change from the water to the air. So uh, I was wondering, in, yeah, is, uh, does it will affect the, uh, grasping force because the, uh, the 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 environment change from the water to the air. Yeah, it's it's possible to design some kind of mechanism. Uh, can both work on the water, uh, in the air. Uh, yeah, something like that. On the water adhesive, a wet adhesive, and a dry <laughs> adhesive, kind of a a, a uniform. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. 
Okay, Professor Yu, thank you very much for your question. First, I would like to thank your jail site, your group's jail site work, which uh, allow us to understand more about the details of the fish surface like the chart, uh, which is very easy to use. And also you can quickly get the results and also uh, get the data. Uh, I think that's a very powerful, uh, uh, powerful tools for, uh, which could advance the understanding of the fish surface or marine uh, animal surface. So for your questions about the adhesion mechanism as shown here in this, uh, in this slides, yes, it's true that the gecko's dry adhesion mechanisms or the wet adhesion mechanisms, especially dry adhesion, cannot be applied on water. So the matter of force uh, effects would vanish when, once it gets into the water. So, but the remoras uh, are adhesion mechanisms uh, because of time and then that's been, maybe I do not explain very clearly. It's based on two major effects. One is a pressure differential. If you look at the rows of the namale, as shown here, I can see. So, um, uh, so I explain this in more details in my uh, recent paper uh, that, so each one of the, so this is a, like a seal. We can generate in a seal and a pressure differential. But on the recent work show that each one of the wells it can generate in a redundant separate uh, chambers, uh, which uh, cannot, uh, will not affect each other. So there's a pressure differential, that's one. The second is uh, they have little spaniels on top, which would enhance, we can generate in mechanical interlock with uh, a, a a rough surface. When smoothing surface, they have soft pieces we can have in more contact. So uh, based on these two mechanisms, uh, it can not only work on water, because the pressure differential will happen no matter it's on water or in the air. So it can also work in the air. So that's why our robots can do this. Because this is a, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, this, this mechanism not only works uh, on water, but in the air. We are intrigued or inspired by one image is that the remora sticking on the dolphin and then dolphin jumping out of water and try to spin out the remoras. Yeah. So we, are, we get inspired from that image. So that inspired us to understand the adhesion effect of the remora disc uh, in the air and on the water. We tested that. Yes, it, it works. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Professor, Thank you, Professor Wen and Professor Yu for the question and answer. Um, I think the next one is uh, Kang Lian. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kang Ziliang. Uh, hi, Professor uh, Wen. A very inspired work, and thanks, uh, Professor Zhao. So, yeah, I am a postdoc um, in MIT uh, co-workers of Kowang and uh, Bingbing. So uh, very inspired talk. So could you please just elaborate a little more about uh, the 3D printing technologies uh, of your unpublished shark skin work? Uh, do you use a commercially available 3D printer? So what is the strategy uh, you use to control the resolutions to like uh, 15 microns? It's very inspiring, thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, I can I can show that image. So yes, it's a it's a commercial available three D printer. So uh, the, we use a nanoscribe for printing the fifty micron tentacles, and while we use another uh, technologies from uh, 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 I think it's the one company I forget the name of it, but that's what. So it's the company is started by Nikas Fong from MIT, I think. So he started a company on. Uh, in Shenzhen, uh, we're allow, which allow us to to print the this one. So actually, it's uh, printed by two different printers. So this one is printed by the uh, the company uh, uh, started by uh, Nikas Bong, so which can print off scale. But this one a printer cannot do this one. This one is like generated by nanoscribe, which uh, but nanoscribe cannot print in a very large piece, but just a very small piece. So I think that's there is a trade-off. If we are hope to understand the app scales with a larger piece of the samples, for example, if we want to put in the water and testing the track using a large force transducer, like our previous study do, 
we need to use this one with uh, with high resolution, but not super high, not extremely high resolutions. But if we under, hope to understand scale down the identical structuring identicals, we need to use the this nanoscribed uh, printer, but it can only print a very small piece. Maybe you can do some uh, material characterization, surface characterization, but without drag property or drag force being measured. I think that's very tricky. I hope my answer can help, can be helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you so much, Professor Wen. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. I think there's uh, also Professor Yu again. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I have one quick question. Yeah, so it's very interesting to see uh, uh, the last project, the stiffness of the material can change from 1.29 megapascal to 0 0.1 pascal, just to change the voltage from, uh, I think it's 11 uh, to 10. So usually speaking, uh, I've, uh, I, 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 I saw that it may take some time. Um, would, would you mind uh, provide a little bit more detail so how long uh, it can change this stiffness? Uh, how is the bandwidth? Yeah. Okay, so actually for the heating process is very quick. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, it's will take you just a few seconds, uh, like seven or five seconds, uh, but the cooling process takes some time. So I that's see. why I think this thing really fits on water because underwater cooling is much faster than in the air. In the air, it may take two minutes, but on water, it may take like 20 seconds. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, to heat it up, uh, it's, it's not a problem, really. It's, uh, it's very quick uh, because uh, there, uh, uh, the material have a very, uh, very good thermal properties, but cooling it down takes some time. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. No, there, there is one raising the hand from the audience. Uh, so Dr. Nan, should we wait for this audience first? Yeah, yeah, let, let him uh, or her. Okay, let me see how to. Uh, actually, I don't know how to let him speak. Uh, maybe. Uh... I, I already did that, but he has no response. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, can Dr. Nan first, and we, we can wait for this audience. Okay, yeah. Actually, he's also my student. <laughs> okay. Uh, Professor Wen, uh, this is a very great talk. So uh, I just have one question regarding the Remora um, uh, sure. project. So um, ha have you, uh, my question is basically, ha have you investigated uh, the scaling of the, the whole structure uh, for the adhesion properties. For example, if you scale the whole thing up by 10 times or 100 times to target uh, big vehicles, uh, does it still work? Uh, also, on the other hand, if you scale it down by, uh, for example, make it sub, uh, sub centimeters or, or even some millimeters, will the mechanisms, uh, do you think the mechanism will change or the performance will change? That's the question. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think this is a really a very good question with regard to size effect. <clears throat> so if you first look at the animals, there are, like what we said, that's true, there are different remora species. In total, there are eight species in the of the remora. So the flower remoras, there are sharp remoras, sharp remoras. So the flower remora is much bigger than the sharp remora. So the disc of the flower remora is about, I would say, almost the 30 centimeters in length, while there's some of the small remoras only have two centimeters, which is about 10 times more than 10 centimeters. So I think from the animals, I would say their scale, their size are relevant to their host. So if we they are sticking on the large whales, so usually the remora is bigger, their sucker is uh, the suction cup is bigger than those uh, remora sticking on smaller host. I think this is reasonable because if you have a large suction cup, try to stick on the small animals, they, they will cause some uh, seal problem. You cannot make the suction adapting the surface. 
if your surface has this curved, you have a large disc which is relatively rigid or not that flexible. You cannot fit the surface. That will cause a problem of that feeding. But if you have a smaller size of the suction cup, you're able to do it. So this is from the, uh, you know, primarily from the normal side. I think that's, that's a size effect. And then from the biomimetic or uh, material structure side, I think the fundamental principle of the size effect is, is almost the same. It's, is a pressure differential is, uh, is a dominating factor to generating the seal, while the little tiny structure on it will increase the friction. But if you scale it up, I, do, I think the uh, this principle still applies. But if you reduce down, I think this depends on how much times, so like if you want to scale down 1,000 times down to like a whole size down to micro, mic or micro size, right? I think there might be some other, uh, like uh, on water, there's some, uh, some other effects. I remember there's one paper talking about there's when suction are very small, uh, there are some other like uh, caviation effects may come out. So, but that's not, we haven't studied that part, but that's very interesting. If you reduce down to like a micro size, overall micro size, um, uh, there's some interesting, new phenomena would possibly uh, uh, be very important. Great, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps Dr. Injun can go first. Uh, thank you, Hui Shan. Uh, yeah, I have just a uh, uh, questions. Maybe I missed that in the talk is about the suction mechanism of the octopus uh, and uh, tactical because I was a bit curious, like uh, why is the, the tapering tapering and taper angle actually have a uh, influence on the mechanical behavior of EI yeah, at this size? Um, I, I, I mean, it is, in, it's true, in, it has been shown in experiments. I'm just wondering what's actually caused the difference between the, uh, between the two. Okay, so this is a very interesting question. So I hope, I hope you play this video again. So if you see here, so I don't know why this video is playing some problems. Can you see the video now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So anyway, it's a, when that's pilling, uh, if you have the uh, uh, cross section like a, a cylinder shape tentacles with yeah. the suckers, uh, because of this, do not have the stiffness gradients. So its stiffness is, is uh, obviously stiffness is lo much larger than the taper uh, angle. So uh, tapered prototype. So when you pull it, trying to try to peel it off, so all the suckers will be suddenly be pulled off altogether. But unlike the the uh, cylinder uh, cross section, the taper forms they have a stiffness gradient or stiffness decrease along uh, from the bottom to the tip. So which can generating like a, uh, so which is more flexible. So more the suckers can stay. Uh, stay contact uh, during this peering process. That's why the adhesion time is much longer, uh, you know, uh, much longer uh, by the uh, tapered uh, robot compared mm -hmm. that with a cross-sectional uh, like signature form. Okay. Okay. So I think that because the shape caused the uh, you know, the stiffness gradients, yeah. and then the stiffness cause the attachment time uh, uh -huh. to be longer than the, uh, than the signature form. Mm -hmm. So is that clear? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's maybe similar to like the crack, crack propagation in the factory mechanics. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. So I think that's why I think the crack, we haven't used that theory to explain this, but that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's very similar to that. Okay, yeah, I see, this I see. very interesting to comparing this two phenomena. Yeah, I see. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. It's very inspiring. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so the next one is Professor Ying Bimbi. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, hi, Prof. Hi. One, uh, very inspirational talk. Uh, I have a follow up, following a uh, follow up question uh, regarding this octopus inspired uh, uh, grasper. So you, I think your, your your group has shown us like you have capability to do micro scale or even nano scale, uh, uh, like three D printing, right? Using the nano scribe. So I'm wondering, have you ever think about like downscale this octopus? Uh, size, the suction size, the cup size into like downscale into like micro or nano scale. Cause I, uh, cause uh, I, I, we just realized uh, like the 2018 nature paper has already like using the, using the micro fabrication technology to do this, uh, to realize this like micro scale suction cup. So I'm wondering, uh, have you ever like thought about using your nano scribe uh, technology to downscale this, and uh, also like use use this technology for micro manipulation, like for cell, for other like fragile stuff. Well, uh, I think this is a very uh, very good question. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, uh, I, I think the uh, using the nano scribe is is our 3D printing tools. Um, yeah, if we can use uh, these tools to make uh, very small size um, to, uh, so that we can make a, a suction cup uh, at uh, micro scale. But I think this depends on what kind of robots you need. For example, if you wanna make a, um, a robot that can uh, grasping and adhesion the cells. I think that would be very cool. But I think the fundamental principle of the octopus suckers is the pressure differential. And also we have a very uh, flexible materials. If you scale it down, um, I don't know the basic principle would change or not, maybe, but maybe the same. So yeah. I say- Yeah, yeah. The, 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 different yeah, engineering the, approach, approach for your purpose, if you want to do some analysis. Yeah, yeah, because I, I saw that, that Nature paper, they they designed this like uh, yeah. micro scale suction for like heart adhesion. They don't like target for a micro object, micro sized objects. So I'm wondering is that doable yeah. or not? I, I noticed that, I noticed that paper, so by a Priya group, if I remember correctly. So there are, they use a concept of the octopus suckers, but they, by taking the geometry of the cross section and they building some uh, uh, by inspired uh, shape, and not using 3D printing, but using a traditional uh, micro nano uh, uh, fabrication methods. Um, they found that the adhesion can be enhanced by this uh, geometry. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. So I think that's something like by inspire from the, the octopus, although it has nothing to do with octopus grasping, but I think the state um, state matters. I think from that. Yeah, yeah. So but but yeah. By the way, the first author is 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 our coworker. So we know this okay. work. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's oh, very nice work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very very inspirational work. And uh, uh, can I ask another question regarding your sure. like. Uh, Ognoa hydrogel work. So you just mentioned the the cooling speed is slow, right? And you mentioned maybe you this cooling speed can the slow cooling speed can be uh, resolved in the underwater in the water environment, right? Yeah, I think so. We haven't tested that yet. Yeah. Okay, but but my 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 question is hydrogel especially like ogno, ogno hydrogen usually swell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they usually swell a lot in the in the in the in the water environment. So, right. so maybe that that would be a, another challenge. Right, right. So I actually this work is collaborated with my collaborator uh, uh, Professor Liu Mingjie uh, from mm -hmm. uh, the chemistry department. So he's uh, he's a student of uh, Professor John Lee. Uh, mm, I see. So uh, the uh, 
I think there are a lot of people working on this, uh, like Boeing, also been driving on you know, the effects of the hydrogens. Um, I'm not an expert on that, so mm. I, I cannot give you uh, more ideas on how to solve that problem. But so here we list this example is to show that when we, I can share some experience of doing this. It's, it's really some, very simple to uh, having this collaboration of you know, adding materials to uh, sophisticated robotic prototypes and show the benefits of grasping things and show the benefits of the material intelligence. As shown here, uh, we actually solve a very simple problem of grasping objects with rough surface. So um, by simply changing the voltage. So it's it, for robotics, adding voltage is very simple. So, and, and if you change the voltage, you're able to change the stiffness. And then you can adapt to very different surface. And all these is be simply by collaborating with a material scientist. So I, I think this can may, you know, um, if we, in the future uh, for the robotics, I think we can sit down and talk to more, more material scientists and see um, what, they, what we can uh, work on together. So, okay. so. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Ying and Professor Wen. Um, I think the next one is Han Jie. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hello, oh, Professor <laughs> Wenli, Professor Zhao Hui Chan. Nice to, to join this fruitful talk. It's really nice. Thank you so much. And I have a, a question about the experiment part because I, I saw uh, from your previous work, like uh, uh, so sensor robotics, soft robots, uh, uh, it's a, a combination of uh, like small patterned uh, uh, structures, you know, uh, but it's used in a, a macro scale uh, structure, like uh, it's a uh, like an arm can hold some large structure. And from the experiment part, uh, it, it, we cannot do them super easily because it, it needs some handle treatment like uh, to assemble them together. But uh, uh, while doing a uh, macro structure and a uh, pattern a lot into a uh, large structure, it takes a lot of time. But there must be some trade off on the uh, uh, how to arrange the experiment for young, like a uh, uh, PhD PhD students. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I'm 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 excited to do this kind of work because now I'm doing. Uh, I'm also in uh, uh, Prof. City's uh, uh, team and do some macro scale structure. But yeah, it's hard to uh, uh, make a lot of structure structures together. So I think from your experience. Uh, maybe can you give some suggestions on this? Okay, so uh, th first, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, um, so I think you are asking about how to make um, a lot of uh, micro robots to um, to help you to um, understand some of scientific sort of questions. Is that right? So, or is a technically um how to fabricating a lot of a micro scale robots? Is that is that your question? Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, I think it's just like a small structure is charming, but uh, we, yeah. we we need to make some really useful functions. When we need uh, this function, we, we need to assemble a lot, uh, like the suction or the mm -hmm. um, uh, the shark mm -hmm. skin, but. Uh, most of the time, we cannot fabricate them to, uh, at the same time or uh, just using one machine. Like you said, you use two 3D printer or uh, laser cutter. But when after that, we need to assemble them together by, by hand. It takes a lot of time. So yeah. I, I'm not sure if it is worthy or how to make the balance between this because for doing for PhD student like me doing research, it's uh, it's harder to, to know if is, this is correct or uh, how should we improve this situation. Yeah. So actually, I think uh, first I would say Professor Menting would be the person who can first talk to. He will give you a lot of ideas about a lot of our fabrication methods. 
But regarding the, your question about how could you put different hierarchical structure all together to make them more multifunctional or multi-scale hierarchy, I would, I would say there are several approaches uh, has been implemented by, for example, by Professor Rob Wood from Harvard University. He implemented like a layer up assembly by, for example, by putting different functional layers by aligning them together, simply bonding them together by plasma. So they can fabricate in very small scales with different functional layers and, and uh, uh, with different materials. And even they can uh, assemble different layer together while using a pump up machines to, 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 uh, immediate, uh, to make it from a two dimensional structure into a full, very complex three dimensional structures uh, and make it move. And by putting structures and materials all together. So I think we can do this at a very small scale. It's very cool. They have, there are some very cool papers you can track down. Uh, Professor Rob Wu's lab. Uh, uh, so if you were able to see that. And also I think that uh, uh, your professor at uh, Medicine City lab, the, he's an expert of um, adding a lot of uh, functional materials, putting a lot of uh, functional material which can be a response to different sim external stimuli. Uh, and then you think about how to put them together and think about what kind of purpose you want to achieve. Uh, so that, uh, and, and after, so all you have to do is solving the technical problems and, and talk to people uh, how this robot can be used for and where this robot can be used to. So, and, if you have any ideas, you can write down and talk to people. So that's my advice to your PhD career. Um, I think that would, so I hope that it can be helpful to you. Great. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. No problem. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I think this is a very good question. It's from uh, Han Jie. I think it's a PhD student. So he yes. asked for. Students, that's very good. Um, so, is there more questions from the audience and also our board? Um, if if no, could I ask a very last question so that we could uh, um, end our talk today? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Professor Wen, I know that you have done a lot of work related to pneumatic systems, including the remoral driven suckerfish and also the soft tentacle. They are all driven by pneumatic um, energy. And you have put, uh, and you have also collaborated with Festo and you have also make your robot to grasp <laughs> things and water. So what is your general thinking about pneumatic systems? Um, is this a simple way to implement for today or you think it will be part of our robotic area in the future? Okay, so uh, thanks very much, Professor Hutan, for your questions. So actually, uh, I would say besides the pneumatics, as many panelists and also many uh, audience here, mm -hmm. you are working on all different materials, like you are working on DE, dielectric elastomers, mm -hmm. and also Professor Menti Sidious lab, and also they're working on marginetics material, mm -hmm. marginetic actually materials that are all very useful for, I would say, different functions for different purpose and different scales. So mm -hmm. pneumatics, I would say, at normal scales, because it's not new things. It's very traditional for, it has been used a lot for traditional, even rigid robotics, mm -hmm. because the air is clean. So you can get air very easily. But it's air, pardon me, it's, it's a little bit loud, but for mm -hmm. anywhere where the sound or the loudness is not a problem, I would say, the air inflation pneumatic is the most simplest way that anyone can achieve uh, very quickly. And it's working very stable. So until now, I think uh, the, the pneumatic soft robots, it's a, I would say have a, most of papers in the academia. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot of papers, maybe not all high impact papers, but the number of papers is, a, is the highest among all the actuation rate. The reason is that it's very simple. And until so far, as I know, it's a it's very robust up as well compared with other smart material actuated. That's so, true. yeah, because the air and the structure, and then you get it before, and then you get it. So, um, and but I think in the future, um, the 
pneumatics, uh, the soft robots will be um, applied or being customized in several areas. I would say because it's, uh, it's uh, I would say is the closest to the commercial products compared with uh, some other uh, soft material actually. But for in academia, I would just say it's uh, many other soft materials actuated, uh, smart materials uh, um, are the future because mm -hmm. um, I still think if you can, you have electricity and simply actuating by electricity with a few volts, maybe not that high, would be a very most promising and be the most ideal case. So if we keep working hard on the uh, electrical actuated materials, I think, I think that's a, they, they would have a bright future. Here's my point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Wen, for your great uh, answer and this great talk. Um, so I think the audience and also the listeners can send Professor Wen emails in the future if you have more questions and uh, let's, Thank Professor Wen for the talk today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Uh, yeah, goodbye. Good night. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> good night. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you. So this is a great event. Okay. Thank you. Very